Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -oh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico. I'm as bad as hell. I am not gonna take this anymore. And welcome back. Taxation is theft. I just love saying that. Um, today I have the awesome Dr. Mary Ruert with me. Welcome. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thanks. Awesome. Glad to have you again. Um, it's been a while since we've talked, um, and it's always a pleasure. And so um, I guess for anybody who doesn't know you, do you want to give yourself kind of a little introduction? I'm, I'm really terrible at that because I'm probably going to talk about the wrong thing. So I'll let you do the honor. Sure. Well, I guess the first thing people should know is that by training, I'm a research scientist. I have a bachelor's in biochemistry, PhD in biophysics and postdoctoral work and faculty membership uh, at the Department of Surgery at St. Louis University. I worked for the Upjohn Company for 19 years, so I've been in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And uh, I currently chair an IRB. I had several years of teaching scientists how to communicate the results in oral, written, or poster form. And so that's my, um, my technical background. Of course, as you know, I'm also a libertarian. And um, I've run for office so many times I've lost track, uh, <laughs> <laughs> including running for the presidential nomination in 2008. I'm also the author of uh, some popular libertarian books, Healing Our World, which is a I guess you could call it a libertarian primer and probably the best compilation of how liberty works in the real world. Uh, short answers to the tough questions, because being a candidate, you know, you don't get to spend hours talking about things. And then um, finally, my most recent book, Death by Regulation, how we were robbed of a golden age of health and how we can reclaim it, which talks about how the FDA and all of those regulations uh, really harm us, shaving about five to 10 years off our lives. Right. And so I just just so you know, um, I'm not I don't just bring anyone on to plug their books. Um, I, I read short answers to tough questions. And that was actually um, I, I think I was just running for the Texas House or or I ran shortly thereafter. I met you in San Antonio and I have a signed copy yes. of that book from that event. And that really that really kind of opened my mind to this because I was really just getting into the Libertarian Party. At that point, all I knew I was I hated the IRS. Um, so, so that opened my eyes some more. And, and then, and then I read death by regulation and seriously, I didn't think I could be any more mad at the FDA until I read that book. And I was like, Oh my God, they're worse than the IRS. Um, so, so those are two definitely very, very awesome books I recommend for everyone to read. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so I, I have a lot of questions and I think everyone has a lot of questions because there's we're kind of going through some scary times right now. The government's telling us, you know, we're all going to catch this virus if we don't stay and lock ourselves in our in our homes. Um, they're telling us it's the scariest thing since like the, the Black Plague. And, you know, there's chaos everywhere. The hospitals are like war zones. And, you know, and it's it's funny because that one, um, you know, some of my friends have actually gone to hospitals and we see they're like really almost empty um and, and there was actually a mainstream news article um i saw that was interesting that actually pointed that out but so so i want to get into some of that and ask some of those questions but i also because you are a you're a scientist you like actually understand how these things work that a lot of us out here trying to do the research on google like really don't understand like we don't understand the nuts and bolts of how these things work so I kind of um, I got some questions from from our viewers um, uh, kind of about this and and I want to dive in and see, you know, what is really going on here. So um, one of the first questions is about these tests. So there's there's all kinds of different tests. Um, we hear that there's tests that can test for the antibodies. There's tests that can test for the virus itself. But I like how does this work? Because I can't imagine 
that they're, you know, pulling blood samples and looking at every single person's, you know, thing under a microscope and looking for this exact virus that looks the same. So how do, how do these things really work? Well, sometimes, you know, it depends on the test and I, I'm not familiar with every test, but I need to start out by saying uh, that even though the Germans had a great test and were willing to ship, us, ship it to us and they had already shipped the World Health Organization a quarter of a million of these tests, uh, the FDA said that we in the U.S. could only use the test that the CDC put out. And it turned out that test was flawed. Uh, I'm still not sure what the flaw was, but uh, they shipped 90 kits out and then had to recall them. So we really didn't have tests until about, you know, about six weeks after that because, you know, we weren't allowed to buy them. And so <laughs> that created really a situation where we're more confused than we normally would be about this because without testing, we can't tell what's going on. As of March 17th, we had tested about one out of 4,300 people in the US. Now, if you compare that to South Korea, they tested one out of 17 people. So they have a pretty good handle on what's going on. We do not. And, and uh, finally, finally on March 24th, um, the German company was allowed to ship to the US and the FDA actually started encouraging uh, commercial manufacturers to try to provide their own test for the US. But there was already a home test kit that came out. It was sent to many people and was recalled by the FDA because they felt, at least this is what was reported in the news, they weren't sure that people knew how to do um, a swab, a nasal swab for the test. So, and I have to tell you the story because, because of this, a lot of what I'm going to say is, you know, not as definitive as we would like because we simply don't know how many people actually have this in the U.S. However, we do have more cases than any other country right now. Uh, Italy, of course, had, uh, you know, they had quite a few cases and they had quite a few deaths, about something in the neighborhood of 7% of the people who got it died, but their average age was 80. So, you know, they were, they were older people and they had 99% of them had a health condition that weakened them and made them more susceptible. So if you're a young person with no other health problems, you know, it's probably gonna be just a bad flu for you. But if you're in an elderly group and you have other conditions, then things are a little different. You know, you need to be a little more careful. Right. Um, so I don't. So you can test. To get back to your original question. Now I kind of give it a long-winded answer. You can test for antibodies or viral fr fragments. So, and I don't know. I, I really don't know what the current tests are because there's several of them out there now. I don't know which ones. So, do what? <laughs> but is that like, you know, how, how do these tests usually work? Is it like, um, uh, do, is it like they're I, like, I, I think some tests for, for other disease, they test for like proteins or, and, and that's, right. that's just like, I mean, is it like a litmus test where like they put, they mix chemicals together and, and expect it to turn a different color or, you know, how no, no, exactly? No. no, they're usually measuring. Well, usually in this case, they're probably measuring RNA, which is, you know, a type of nucleotide that's specific to the virus. That's, and of course you can have antibody tests as well. And, and there's some good reasons to do that because there have been some cases in Europe where they have infused people with the blood of survivors and feel that they've, you know, they've gotten some good results. And I, again, I need to caution everything I say on this, these, these treatments, um, they haven't been thoroughly tested. So right. one has to take them with a grain of salt. And there's quite a few of them out there. Stem cells have also been reported to be successful, but not in definitive studies. And of course, most people have heard about the anti-malarial drugs. Right. <laughs> Hydrox yes. The, <laughs> and, yeah, I was going to ask you about the high. Is, how do you pronounce that? Hydroxychloroquine is the main one. And it was used in France with a, an antibiotic um, it's erythromycin, and uh, they had 42 subjects or patients that, that volunteered to take this combination. And the French reported that they did better than people who didn't want to take that. But again, they're kind of self-selected. And the problem with that is people who are willing to take the chance on something new uh, have a little bit different mindset than people who are more cautious. 
and of course the placebo effect is a very real effect and it would you know we don't know exactly how it works but it wouldn't surprise me to find that people who are more willing to take a risk are also more likely to experience the placebo effect so that study while it was promising it didn't really tell us if it works and then of course in china they had 30 patients who got the hydroxychloric um chloroquine and um they didn't see any difference between the the patients who got conventional treatment and those that got conventional treatment plus the anti-malarial drug right and and i i want to go back a little bit because you mentioned about the the age in um in uh italy, italy. Mm -hmm. um and I, so uh, my grandmother was in like a, um like a senior home uh, for a while um, and she had, you know, she had a few different illnesses um, that were, you know, like long term. And I noticed that whenever like whenever it was like regular flu season, they would lock that place down um, because they knew that, you know, even just the regular flu to to, you know, elderly people with with all kinds of other um, existing conditions could mm -hmm. just absolutely. I mean, um, uh, what is it? Uh, pneumonia. Um, and, and all these other conditions could just could just come out of that very, very That's easily. Right. So mm -hmm. so um, I, I think a, a big concern that a lot of people have is that, um, you know, the whether it's the uh, the government or, or whoever else is uh, the media is, is promoting this, um, they're kind of blowing it out of proportions. Is there any real indicator that we have so far as as fact like or or are we just kind of guessing that this is really more dangerous than you know a, a a strong flu well everything i've seen you know this is a sars virus um just to let you know and and of course we had a sars i guess you could say epidemic um several years ago and i from what I have seen, and again, always take it with a grain of salt because we don't have all the data yet. Right. Uh, but from what I've seen, this is not as bad as SARS was, the other SARS that we had earlier. So um, again, we just, because we aren't testing people, especially here in the US, it's very, very hard to know how many people are actually infected. In fact, uh, to tell you a little story, I have several friends that are in their 60s and early 70s that got a very severe flu just a few months ago, uh, very severe. They didn't have to go to the hospital, but they didn't have any other conditions that I'm aware of. And, uh, but it took them um, a good month to get over it and they were really sick. And I, you know, this thing could have been around <laughs> right. here earlier. And so it's, it's a little difficult, as I said, to tell, because if these people are survivors, then we've had it for a while. And, and that's not so strange because there's some evidence coming out, uh, and again, not definitive, <laughs> right. but some evidence coming out that it might have originated actually in the U.S. or at least not in China, because China oh, wow. only has, yeah, there's minor variants. Um, uh, you know, what we do is we look at the different variants uh, of a virus. And if you have lots of variants of that virus in a country, then, you know, there's a good chance that maybe it originated there. But if you only have the single, the single variant that's making people sick, then, you know, you think it's been brought in from somewhere. And right. that's kind of the situation. Uh, at least that's how it's appearing at this point in time. Again, this all is very preliminary. So I just wanted to pass that on. So I'm, I'm trying to look up the um the numbers for SARS I remember that and it was it looks like 2003 um and uh, uh I was I was what in my early 20s then but I, I kind of remember this going on but I think the world was not as connected or at least not for me anyway there weren't um I didn't I certainly didn't know anybody that was traveling back and forth from China I do now um uh, so is it possible that th the world is just more more connected now, which could make this sure. more serious than, than what the SARS outbreak was? Yes, it's very possible. It's very possible. As I said, you know, everything I say, take with a grain of salt, because we just don't have all the information we need. Right. OK, um, so um, let's see. So let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about vaccines, um, because 
I know that that's already a, a heated <sighs> debate topic among libertarians and everybody else. But um, I guess, like, how is a vaccine actually created? And is is I mean, is it is it so I guess methodical that you can literally take any virus and, and do the same process with it and now you have a vaccine or is it completely conditional on how a certain virus acts as to how you would create a vaccine for that and and you know what's the does that like is is it something where like oh it can be you know whenever we have the virus we can create the vaccine or does like months or years of research have to go into it to figure it out depending on on what type how does that work yeah in general there is a process, but I say in general because there are are bugs, if you will, <laughs> that uh, yeah, that that you know aren't as easy to manipulate, sh shall we say, as others. Um, and generally speaking, um, the way it's been going is that you know it takes at least the projections I've heard is that there's going to be um, that there actually may have started to be some testing of the vaccine. Um, so. You know, it doesn't take long to make it if it's, you know, you can use the kind of the generalized process. And the thing is, though, again, uh, to, to really make sure it works, you know, you would have to do tests that take a fairly long time. Uh, by fairly long, I mean, you know, uh, the projections I've seen are it's going to be at least till the end of the year, maybe a little longer. Wow. But it, a lot of depends, you know, a lot depends on how rigorous the FDA wants to be about these things. And actually, um, HHS has, has said they're going to exempt manufacturers of vaccines, treatments, and devices for this virus from any liability except for gross misconduct. So that's going to, yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but Vaccines, of course, because they are usually only given once or, you know, maybe a booster or two, um, haven't been extremely profitable in the past. So about 10, 15 years ago, I don't remember the exact date, um, there were only two vaccine manufacturers left. What the uh, uh, government did, because it was afraid there weren't going to be enough vaccines, is it said, OK, vaccine companies will no longer be liable. And this was a big deal because, you know, vaccines are a biological product, which in general have more side effects than, say, a chemical. Um, so uh, this was a big deal. And so then vaccines proliferated. And this big schedule we have for young children, which is what now, 36 vaccines in the first five years or something, this is all new, you know, back right. back in my day, we didn't, uh, you know, we had one or two vaccines, you know, so um uh, that's that's new, and it's because the liability was lifted. So now the government assumes liability. It's a government court that decides whether or not you know you've been injured by a vaccine and whether you should be compensated and how much. And by um, relieving the industry of liability, I suspect what we're going to see is a lot of people, a lot of businesses getting involved in producing something, which you know. <laughs> It's good in a way, but it's bad in another way, because how long is this virus going to be around? You know, right. <laughs> is it going to be around next year? You know, I don't know. So it, we could we could be we could be spending a lot of time and energy uh, working on something that's not going to be around next year, although I doubt it. I think this will probably be around for for some time. So um, there, there are a lot of people talking about if um I guess some people are saying, you know, if we don't have an absolute lockdown, um, then somebody, you know, let's let's say um, I think they extended it to April 30th at this point. Um, if April 29th, somebody goes out to get groceries, they get infected. Um, and then now the now the uh, you know, the, the lockdown or the quarantine, whatever you want to call it, is over and everybody's out. Now this one person just got infected and they're going to be spreading this for the next couple of weeks. Um, do you think that it's inevitable that a lot of people are ultimately going to get this. Um, do you think that the the I guess you know the government might uh, might continue this lockdown even longer, uh, you know, like till the end of the year or something ridiculous? Um, or, or do you think the government is even um, maybe uh, overreacting uh, to what it should be doing? 
Well, you know, there really isn't a way to have a complete lockdown because, you know, uh, doctors and healthcare workers need to go into the hospitals. Uh, delivery people need to keep delivering or there's not going to be any deliveries to the hospital. You know, and that means food, medicine, and, and that's true even for the grocery store and the grocery workers are good. So there isn't really any way to do a full lockdown. Uh, and, and so, um, I, I mean, I think it would be, <laughs> it would be uh, reasonable to expect that we are going to see some people getting infected. I think a better way to handle this might've been to, now that we have the information on Italy, which is almost over its, at least its first wave, you know, I think it would be now that we know who's at risk, I think it would be smarter, perhaps, to try to protect those people and the younger people who, if they get it, are basically going to have a bad flu, maybe should be going to work. And the reason I say that is you can only dampen the economy down to this extent for so long before you have major problems in deliveries and you know things that we absolutely need. And the problem is you can't just flip a switch one day and have it all start up again and be right. all wonderful and good. You know, it takes time to build up inventory to get people back on the road. So, you know, there we can't totally lock the thing down even if we wanted to. And um, you know, the longer we do it, the more consequences are going to be, especially for people who are put out of work by this. And, you know, $1,200 is not going to save them. Right. And that's the number that uh, has been bantered around by uh, Trump is something he's going to presumably give people who are in the lower right. income brackets. It's, it's it, not going to they, help. They actually, <laughs> they, they, so they put out the actual bill and apparently there are a lot of exceptions um, and qualifications. If you didn't file your 2018 and 2019 income taxes yet, you're not eligible. Um, if you owe back <laughs> child support, you're not eligible. So um, there's some there's some interesting uh, ties to that. Um, Laura just asked. Uh, she posted a comment. Um, if we were told we had another variant of coronavirus in December, is it possible it was the novel? Uh, coronavirus, but it was misidentified due to being unknown. Anything's possible in that realm. Yes. Uh, you know, or it could be, it could be a variant that is, you know, that is, how can I say this? Um, yeah, there's a lot of strains out there. There can be a lot of different ones and there can be genetic um, reactions as well to some of these variants. And, and that is what's been speculated as part of the problem in Italy. Although I have to say, if the average age is about 79, 80, you know, clearly what that means in real life is that, you know, most people were in their 70s. And the problem is when you get to the older <laughs> ages, if, if you don't have a condition now, you know, you can probably anticipate that you will in the next 10 or 20 years because that's what happens to us, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now there are some things you can do to help yourself. Um, uh, you know, obviously you want to do all the right things for your body, you know, exercise, eating right, uh, and taking some supplements uh, that might help your immune system. And there's a lot of discussion out there about them. Uh, I have a dear friend, Dr. Lindsay Berkson, who put out a, a great paper on some of the things you could do. I'll just very briefly mention uh, high dose melatonin seems to uh, be effective. Uh, Vitamins A, D, C, iodine, and zinc are all things that may help your immune system. The problem is we don't have good ways to test what our immune system needs. So right. if you take these things, some of them might not be necessary. That's just the way it is. Right. Now, um, I, I know you have a lot to say about this next question because... Um, uh, cause I read your book. Um, but so, okay. So we're presented with this, this curve and we're, they tell us that basically if there was no lockdown, everybody would go out, everybody would get infected and, and everyone would rush into the hospital. And it's, it's this curve that would go really high and it would go so high that it would go above this line. That is the medical capacity. And my question is, um, I guess this is this is more of my question to the government or to Trump 
is to say, instead of trying to bring that line down by locking us all in our homes, why don't you try to, to raise the line up so the hospitals have higher capacity? Because um, from what I understand, there are doctors here that aren't allowed to practice. There's all kinds of medication that's not being released because of the FDA. Um, even the, the there was even, uh, we, we talked about the test kits earlier, but there was there was a company, I think in South Carolina that was actually producing them and they had to, they were rushing through the FDA process. Um, and, and eventually Trump just said, okay, you know, forget the FDA, you can, you can, we can use those tests. Um, but I, don't you think that's a much better plan to try to raise that line than to try to flatten the curve? Well, actually, yes. And, and there's some, there are some things being done along those lines. Um, one of the things is, you know, doctors have their license in a particular state, so they can't prescribe across state lines oftentimes, mm -hmm. unless they also have, you know, a license in that other state. Well, they have backed down on those regulations. It used to be that doctors could not use their personal cell phone for telemedicine. They've backed down on that. Uh, so there's several things like that that they're now allowing. Wow. It should have been allowed anyhow, right? right. <laughs> and so that's what, and, and hopefully once this crisis has passed, those things will stay in place. The other thing that the FDA has done is it has loosened it restrictions on ventilators. So for example, let's say in hospital, has a ventilator and now it wants to monitor <clears throat> what's going on with that ventilator and that patient through Bluetooth. Well, normally it has to reapply to the FDA because it made a modification of the ventilator. Now it's allowing such modifications wow. and it's allowing things like CPAP machines to be substituted for ventilators should the hospital not have enough. But this should already be happening right. <laughs> you know so there's a lot and and um, also um the fda is uh, being much more um proactive at getting um drugs and and their indication out the door although they kind of backtracked for a while because what happened when trump made these statements about the anti-malarial drugs is there was such a run on them that they're they're not available even though even though, as I explained earlier in this program, the, the results are not definitive. And sadly, sadly, people who really need these drugs are sometimes not getting them. I read a story about a woman with lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. She's been on um, hydroxychloroquine and uh, Kaiser Permanente sent her a letter and said, don't bother to try to get a prescription for this, you know, our doctors are not going to prescribe it. Our pharmacies are not going to give it to you. Uh, we're saving it for people who have this virus. And thank you for your sacrifice. Wow. So, yeah, so this woman now, now this drug stays around a long time, but it won't be at optimal levels for this woman. And actually it puts her at risk because she is already a high risk person uh, having lupus. So now she's going to be put at risk and again, the studies are not definitive. Now, should people be allowed to take these drugs if they want them? As far as I'm concerned, yes, of course, if they want to take that chance. Um, but the thing is to, to pull the drug from people who need it and, you know, are doing well on it. That just that just isn't right, in right. my opinion. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And so there was I guess there was a story um, somebody. I don't know if it's the same ingredient that's in this, but somebody bought like fish tank cleaner or something. Yes. Yes. And they took it and died. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, and there's other things in fish tank cleaner. I mean, so, I don't, that is, I don't know. So, so that is one of the components, but obviously there's a lot of other things in there. Yeah. Um, I would think, I would think those other things would be toxic, but of course I, right. I don't know what exactly the, the, it was a couple, I believe. I don't know exactly what they took. I'm sure it was like bleach or something, um, which is I, I, I shouldn't laugh. It's it's terrible. But um, yeah, I mean, this is I, I don't know. I kind of in a way I kind of feel like, you know, sometimes people they 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 hear everything that's going on in the news. They start to panic. They do a little research. They find out, oh, this this tablet has actually that ingredient and mm -hmm. they're not getting any like real. Um, and I get that, you know, there, we don't have a lot of real information available and a lot of people are just kind of guessing at this point. But it, yes. it seems like like the lack of, of transparency into, you know, if they would just tell us we're trying like we don't know, we're trying to figure things out. Um, don't panic. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. 
like the government is really yeah yeah i think it would it would just prevent so much of this this um you know this this thing now at the same time there's you know there are people who might be um fatally ill um and and you know like you know they're they're at the end and like they're ready to try you know whatever whatever is mm -hmm. possible because if i don't get something the doctors say i'm gonna die tomorrow um I, and I know, like, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything for this particular disease, but I know in the past, you know, some people have been refused, uh, you know, the use of experimental drugs because yes. they're not approved yet. But it's you're going to die in a couple <laughs> days anyway. Why That's won't right. you let me try this? Exactly. Exactly. And and again, as far as I can tell, the FDA hasn't backed off on its need to prove efficacy or effectiveness. Um, there are several types of drugs that are being studied right now. I just want to mention them so your audience is aware of them. There's some drugs that are used to prevent HIV, you know, and AIDS. And so those are being tested because they're antivirals, right? So they might work on this. Um, and then it looks like the virus um, enters through the ACE receptor, the angiotensin uh, two type one receptor and it's blocked by some of the things that we use to lower blood pressure and so um, you know ace inhibitors or what they call arbs um, that block the receptor these are also being tested because if they can block the receptor maybe the virus can't get right. in right but th these drugs also because they block something like that, then the body starts making more of it so it's not clear quite yet if that's which which thing is going to predominate the body making more of it or <laughs> when right. you block it or or whether that will actually be effective so again i just want to point that out and then there's many theories out there uh, about how uh, you know why people become susceptible and of course if you if you and you know feel like one of these is correct for example elderly people have low nitric oxide content and you could test for that in your saliva and, you know, you can take over-the-counter supplements uh, such as citrulline or arginine. Uh, there's a number of supplements that increase nitric oxide, even if it's only for a short period of time. And again, you can, you can buy saliva test strips, you know, on Amazon or whatever to test that. So if that turns out to be the case, there'll be a number of other drugs that would be effective in um, helping to increase your nitric oxide levels. And of course, the thing that uh, I'd like to share with your listeners is it does appear that heat uh, can incapacitate this virus. And the, the temperature at which it does seems to be around 133 degrees Fahrenheit. To give you some idea of what this is, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, our body temperatures, um, of course, are 98.6. So if you... Uh, if you do get the virus or even really <laughs> the flu of any kind, it's probably helpful to, uh, you know, to use some steam, uh, possibly with eucalyptus oil or Vicks VapoRub, which has eucalyptus in it. If you have a vaporizer, you may get some benefit uh, from doing something like that. Uh, uh, you know, you have to be careful because you don't want to breathe uh, steam at 212 degrees, you'll burn your lungs, right. you know, but there may be, there may be some, and that's a standard home remedy for uh, people who have respiratory diseases. So something that's to think about. Is that so, so I'm, I'm just picturing how this would work. But, um, wouldn't that only be effective if the virus is, is on the surface of, um, of your airway or your lungs, not that's if it's where, in your bloodstream? Well, that's where it mostly is um you know that's one of the places it likes to enter you know and stay so yes but you know if you kill off some of it your immune system hopefully will compensate <laughs> right okay awesome yeah you know so it's you know again it's i'm not saying it's a cure i'm just saying it's something that at least will re relieve congestion probably so it's worth a try right so there's this um i, I want to ask you about a couple conspiracy theories that have been going around um and and well, this first one, I don't know this this it sounds plausible, but the the way that I heard it, it sounded like it was coming from some conspiracy theory outlet that a lot of the people who have died from uh, from the coronavirus have also had ibuprofen in their system. Um, yes. Is that actually true? 
Well, okay, so yes, there are a number of videos out on the internet uh, saying don't take ibuprofen uh, because if you think about it, but but again, again, it's not. <laughs> not it hasn't been definitively, right. yeah, because think about it, you know, what the, this one doctor was saying, well, the patients who died all had ibuprofen in their system. Uh, a lot of the other ones didn't. Well, you know, if you have a severe flu and you've taken aspirin and acetaminophen, uh, things which at least for me don't do much, <laughs> right. you're going to be, you're going to be uh, going for the uh, ibuprofen bottle, right? So, uh, you know, is that, did those people take that because they were sicker than the other ones who lived or did they, you know, is this actually a problem? And I, you know, I, uh, the company I worked for is the one who put it on the market here in the U S right. As Motrin. And so we did a lot of work with it and I find that to be surprising. Uh, if that's true, um, it's, I'm not saying it can't be true, but it's an anti-inflammatory and it, it works on, a pathway which um, which helps people because it really decreases inflammation, which, if you think about it, is part of the problem in this disease if you get it, because you get pneumonia, you get inflammation, your lungs are compromised by that. I would think I would think that the initial thought would be it shouldn't be a problem, it should actually be helping. But again, anything's possible. We don't know enough yet. So um, again, everybody's got to make that uh, decision for themselves. Right. And uh, yeah, but it's not definitive by any means. Yeah, that's that actually that actually makes a lot more sense uh, when you put it in perspective like that. It's like it's like the cause and effect. That's that's more of an effect of of people getting sick. Um, so uh, this other one, I'm sure, is absolute nonsense. But I, I, I want to get um, your opinion on on how this uh, <laughs> on how to how to debunk this. But the theory is that uh, 5G radiation from these new 5G towers oh, yeah. is causing. This is how I heard some guy. I like I sat down and I listened to like his whole like half hour thing on this. He says it. Um, it makes your your own cells become toxic and then they emit the COVID-19 virus. And I'm like, that just doesn't make any. So you're telling me all of these people are producing this identical virus out of a vacuum and, and then yeah, it's that's, spreading. That, <laughs> no, no, I mean, 5G may have some health issues. You know, that's a possibility. Um, I haven't studied it, so I can't give you a professional opinion. Um, however, if it did, what it would do is weaken your cells, and that might make them more susceptible to the virus. I mean, let's face it, your body has a mechanism to counteract this virus. It makes antibodies <laughs> if right. you have a healthy immune system, which, of course, again, as you get older, you might not. So, And this is why I think people thought to uh, take plasma from people who had recovered and put it into people who haven't yet recovered. And again, there's been anecdotal evidence that this may work. Uh, it hasn't been definitive either. But again, well, you know, if, this is the way we find things right. out. We try things. Yeah. If, if you were to do that, what, um, because your body has to produce the antibodies. Um, if, if you were to, I guess, transplant antibodies from somebody else, um, how long do those last? And is there, I mean, is the idea that you would, you would transplant enough of them just to get you through it and, and kill the virus? Or does it somehow get your body to start like to recognize it and start producing it? What's, what's the theory behind yeah. that? Well, the viral load is an important part of whether you can survive it or not. If you have a heavy viral load, um, then, you know, you're going to be sicker. So if you can, if you can, be infused with antibodies that take out even part, a fraction of the viral load, you know, you're going to probably be better off. Right. I guess that's, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Cause if you're, I guess if your own body's fighting it a little bit, but just not enough, you get a little bit of an extra boost to kill that's some right. of those. Okay. That makes sense. So, mm -hmm. yes. so, um, I guess, um, not to go back to the 5g thing, but where, so like, so where do viruses come from? Is this, is this like, do they evolve from 
some other form. Um, I mean, we hear that like they were transmitted through different animals and, and uh, something like that. Um, what like where they obviously don't just, you know, create themselves out of thin air. Um, how do they usually kind of enter our um, our society, I guess? Well, you know, the viruses have been around since we have been, at least as right. near as we can tell, and they're constantly mutating. So, um, you know, they're always going to be with us. There's always going to be mutations. And when those mutations make them more deadly to us, you know, then obviously we're going to have problems. Um, there's, you know, it's interesting. There's, um, there was a, a book written, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it. It was like, uh, Guns, germs, and uh, some. Anyhow, it was the theory was okay. That sounds like but a good the, book. Yeah, but the theory was that it's our domestication of animals uh, that have really uh, created in the Western world have created um, a lot of immunity to things that, for example, uh, native people in isolated societies never got. So, for example, when Columbus and the Spaniards came over uh, to Mexico and, and North America, what ended up happening was most of the native people there died, not because of a war, but simply because of infection. And so um, it, there, and I mentioned this because you talked about coming through animals. I think there is some pretty good evidence that a lot of the diseases that we have um, especially in the Western world, may have started because of our domestication of horses and cows and mm. sheep, things like that. That's interesting. So, um, is it so? Is it possible that I mean, we should look at this this virus as here to stay, and everyone through you know whatever time it takes will eventually likely just become uh, immune or resistant to it to some level. We'll either become resistant or maybe we'll have a vaccine or maybe the, it's it, for whatever reason, its numbers will diminish. You know, it's I mean, there are there are microbes that we have pretty much gotten rid of. The polio virus is one of them. <laughs> right. so, and, yeah. and so this is as as a dog lover and a dog owner. Um, so this is this is interesting, too, because we talk about viruses going between animals and, and possibly coming from animals. And of course, it's um, I, I don't know, like I, what what is it? What is different about the biology of different species that um, I guess some animals can carry it but not be affected by it um, or or some some just won't even carry it. It'll just it not you know, not even fit in their, in, in their, in their system at all. What, what is it that's different about us? You know, cause we look, you know, especially mammals, we're all, we're all meat and flesh and blood. Um, what, what is it that, that makes a virus, uh, particularly more, um, uh, dangerous against certain species? Well, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can give you a really good answer. I, I may just not know it, but obviously the the ability to produce antibodies against it is one of the biggest things. Uh, so if, if we are a person who just, their immune system just isn't very good, that's going to be an issue. But as a species, that could happen too. It could happen that, um, you know, as a species, we're just not able to, our, our systems aren't as easily able to recognize and uh, uh, mount a defense against a particular virus. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, and what about, um, what about reinfection? And I guess we've, we've kind of talked about this already, but, um, what, I guess, you know, some things like chicken pox, right? You, we always hear like, yeah, make sure your kids get chicken pox so they'll never get it again, which I, I don't know why that's a thing because why, like, like why not get it when, whenever you get it, like instead of forcing it to happen sooner. Um, but is, so, so there's that, but then are like, I, I've had the flu more than one time in my life. Um, is it, is it that my body forgets how to make the antibodies or is it a, a, a different mutation of the flu? Um, and what do you think we can expect from the COVID-19? It could be either. It could be either. You know, we don't, um, 
we don't always have lifetime immunity. Although back in the days when I was getting measles and chicken pox, what we did back then is we had parties to infect right. the rest of the people. <laughs> the reason was, is at least with those, you do more or less get a lifetime immunity. And especially for women, uh, if you are carrying a child and and happen to get it as an adult, it's much more dangerous to the I fetus see. than it would be. So that was why there was there was no other way to protect um, women from from uh, having uh, an unfortunate event with their their baby if they contracted it as an adult. Um, so that was now. Of course, when we get vaccines today, they generally do not give us lifetime immunity, which is why we get boosters. But uh, my understanding, at least with the measles, is you have about a 70 year uh, window of immunity if you got it as a child, so. Interesting. So is is that, um, I mean, cause they have a, they have a measles vaccine. Is, is, is it actually better to get the measles than to get the vaccine? Well, if you want lifetime immunity, the answer is yes. Uh, but the thing is, um, even people who get the measles vaccine, sometimes your immune system just can't react enough and well enough to give them that immunity. And I don't know if that's because we give so many vaccines these days, you know, and, and the system is overwhelmed or um, if we have a more compromised system, you know, it's. We, we really, in this country, we really have so much processed food, it's actually somewhat difficult to get um, and maintain good, what I'd say is good health by standards of say even 50 years ago. So for example, we have more omega-6s in our diet and not enough omega-3s unless you take fish oil. <laughs> you know, because back in the early days, people took cod liver oil to prevent problems with deficiencies of vitamins A, especially in D. So, you know, we right. don't do those things anymore. So, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it's it's really difficult. I was having this conversation with a friend uh, last night, actually, about what's like, you know, what's the good food to eat. And, you know, basically it came down to anything that's in a package is bad for you or doesn't have any <laughs> nutrients in it. And I'm like, man, that that totally is going to change my entire shopping habits. Um, exactly. But I guess also like even the, even the foods that we get off the shelf don't have like even, you know, apples and carrots and things might not have, um, might not have as much because of the way that they're grown now, I guess with, with the, um, uh, they add, uh, extra fertilizers that make it grow faster. They use soil. that has been depleted for so long. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, ah, it's, that's well, the the yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the biggest thing is we eat too much. You know, um, if you want to live a long life, if you eat about 80% of the calories you actually want, you will extend your life. This has been tested in all species, including humans. Uh, but, you know, it's really hard to have caloric restriction in today's environment. And even if you want to do it, um, it's, you know, it's very hard if you want to socialize and go out to restaurants and things like that, or if you travel, you know, um, also we have much more sugar in our food than we've ever had before. It's actually getting very difficult to buy right. things without sugar that didn't used to have it in there. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, there's definitely sugar. Like I've, I've kind of gotten to the point where like whenever I taste food, you can like when you're when you start looking for it or tasting for it you can taste the amount of sugar that's in stuff and it's it is it's absolutely insane um uh but all right so so i guess um we've asked a lot of questions do you have anything anything else that maybe i missed um i didn't talk about that you think is really interesting about this um that you want to share well, I think one of the most interesting things is there's an acknowledgement by government that some of the ways in which, for example, the FDA operates just, you know, really slows the whole thing down. And my hope is, and because I'd like to end on a positive note, my hope is that one of the good things that will come from this crisis is an understanding and uh, that at a much higher level than it's been, that all of this regulation can actually have a very negative effect because it keeps, uh, you know, it keeps us from getting new medicines in a, in a very fast way. It used to be back before 1962 that it took about four years for a new drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace. 
Now it takes 10 to 14 years, <laughs> depending on the drug. Well, you know, that means you've got a whole decade of, of people who die waiting for the drug that could save them. And there's kind of an acknowledgement in this crisis that we are overregulated because the FDA has backed off on like telemedicine and uh, crossing state lines for physicians and things of this nature. You know, this never should have we never should have had right. these regulations in the first place. So my hope, my hope is that when this crisis is over, that we won't be going back to the way it was, but we'll be acknowledging that there's a better way, less regulation. So um, I, I want to hear this from you. Should we just get rid of the FDA? And if so <laughs> what should we replace it with? Yeah. Well, I mean, ideally, I think that would be great. But of course, the, the reality is that probably isn't going to happen. If we did get rid of it, we would have certification by other um, private entities. In fact, we have that now uh, to some extent. So, for example, the Abigail Alliance focuses on cancer drugs. And over the years, it has identified 40 cancer drugs that it urged the FDA to approve. And eventually they were approved, but a couple of years later <laughs> than the Abigail Alliance recommended. Now, this is a group of lay people. Hey, if the lay people can tell when a drug is approvable two years before the FDA approves it, uh, maybe certification will work just fine. <laughs> right. And of course, uh, there is a plan in place that's sort of a hybrid of the FDA and um, uh, not in place, I should say, is being proposed uh, by the Heartland Institute. It's called free to choose medicine. And what it does is it really generates a parallel track to the FDA. After a drug has gone through what we call phase one testing, which is like the initial safety testing in people and one uh, phase two study in humans, which is a kind of a mix of safety and effectiveness. So the idea here is that in the early stages of clinical testing, a company could decide that it would put its drug on the free to choose medicine track. And then it could develop it and uh, um, basically market it without ever getting an FDA approval. Now, the nice thing about that is that it would cut the most expensive part of the process out and the most lengthy part of the process out. So patients would get drugs earlier. But if you're somebody who's very conservative and you want to wait for the FDA to bless it, you could do that too. Right. So that it's, it's kind of a win-win situation. And the nice thing about it, it would allow us to compare drugs that go through the free to choose medicine track and the drugs that go through the FDA. So that might be a good way to uh, shift in the direction of no FDA. So that is something I support and talk about whenever I can and whenever someone asks me about alternatives. So, um, you know, heartland.org is the, is the uh, website you can go to, or you can just put free to choose medicine in, you know, Google and it'll come up. Awesome. Well, I, I want to thank you so much, um, and I want to give you an opportunity um, to to give your website, plug your book, um, you know, anything else uh, uh, that you have. Um, if somebody wants to learn more about you or what you're doing, or or if somebody wants to find your books and buy them, um, go ahead and, and take the opportunity to. to plug everything go for it <laughs> sure sure well if anyone has questions i'm happy to answer them i do answer all my email but the best way to contact me really is through my website at ruart.com r-u-w-a-r-t.com because i get a special flag on those emails and so i won't think it's spam <laughs> and um if, if for some reason i don't answer try again because i do i do make it a point to answer everything you can see my books there you can see the endorsements um the 1993 edition of Healing Our World is actually in the free library, so you can check it out. And then if you really like it and want more, you can go for the 2015 edition. Amazon carries everything if you'd rather go through Amazon. And um, let's see. Oh, and I have a, have a number of videos and things like that on my website as well. I have a YouTube channel and a Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook posts. And if you go to the first page of ruart.com, scroll down to the right side towards the bottom, you'll see links to all that. So, you know, uh, please go ahead and, and enjoy. 
Awesome. All right, Mary, thank you so much. Everybody go check out her books, go check out her website. I promise you won't be disappointed. Um, she's really got some amazing things. Um, thank you again so much for joining me on the show. Uh, we learned a lot. Hopefully everybody watching learned a lot. Um, that's really some great information and, um, we'll see you next time. Taxation is theft. Yes. Thank you for having me and, uh, good day to everyone listening. Awesome. Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the capital will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -huh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? Roads. <laughs> you boys like me!